Hello lovely people, I'm Kathryn and welcome to week three of the, my slow stitch along for 2024. Um, before I get into that, I just wanted to show a couple of things people have asked about following my studio tour that I put online the other day. So the first one, and I hope you can see it, was um, I showed uh, my fir the first prize that I won for a quilted piece. And I said it was a seagull and there was a lady in the comments, I'm sorry I can't remember your name, who said that she loved birds, and seabirds in particular, and could you see it? So I've got it down off my daughter's wall, and um, probably I have to back up a bit, excuse the noise in my chair. <clears throat> and there he is. Um, the theme was flying high, and I lived very near the seaside at the time, so it seemed appropriate to do a seagull. All the stitching was done on the sewing machine, but all the little pieces of his feathers i try and zoom in a bit. Can you see? Can you see? All the little pieces of his feathers were cut out of scraps of fabric with nail scissors. <laughs> Took quite a long time. And then they were laid on to a little backing piece um, out of which I'd cut the bird shape. And then it was all free machine stitched. So that was my seagull. So that's him. And the second thing was um, I showed my bookshelf, my collection of books about textiles and so on. Um, and I was asked if I could share some of them um, as I go along. So the first one I wanted to share with um, is Slow Stitch by Claire Wellesley Smith. Now this to me was, um, I, I was kind of doing Slow Stitch already without being aware of the concept. And then when I found this book, it was like, yes, that's me, that's what I'm doing, that's what it's called. So um, it was a very important book to me, and I still refer to it now. The subtitle is Mindful and Contemplative... I can't say it. Contemplative? <laughs> Contemplative? It's like applique and applique all over again. Um, anyway, whichever, textile art, and it's published by Batsford, and it's still available, and she talks about all kinds of things in here which is the same kinds of things I talk about um, when I talk about slow stitch. And I'm looking at you over the top of my glasses like I'm a schoolmistress. Anyway, so that was those two things. So as to this week, week three's theme, uh, the word for the theme, put my glasses back where they belong, is diversity. And um, I got that word from a lady in our private Facebook group. If you're a subscriber and you would like to join, it's lovely. It's such a lovely community of people sharing their work, supporting each other and so on. Um, I'll pop the link down in the description. Um, uh, anyway, uh, this lady referred to diversity and that word kind of popped in my brain and I started thinking about what that means in terms of differences between people and so on. Obviously diverse is different. Um, but also I feel within the concept of that word there's an aspect of acceptance of the differences and as someone who was born and brought up in England and lived in England most of my life and now live in France, although that's only the neighbouring country, there are pe people do things differently, you know, and it's first of all recognising that and secondly accepting that the way that's familiar to you is not necessarily the only way and not necessarily the best way either, you know, it's just what's familiar to you. So anyway, so then I had to take the concept of diversity and translate it into textiles cloth. Um, so I thought of all the different cultures, the global cultures that I was aware of, that I'd learned about, you know, over the years. And I narrowed it down to the cultures that have inspired me. So that is um, patchwork and quilting, which is part of my own heritage and very much a part of the American heritage as well. Um, Japanese borrow. Um, canther and uh, darning. I always remember my grandmother darning woolen clothing in particular and socks and so on. So those are the four that I've chosen. So let's get into the business of creating. Okay? Okay, so here I have got four little piles of cloth. Um, just I'll quickly run you through them because I'm going, I'm going to be making four pieces because of the four um, textile traditions that I talked about, but my journal pages, here's my journal, um, are five by seven. So I need to make sure that my four my four pieces are going to fit 
on my page. So they're going to be weeny weeny. Now you don't have to do four, you could just do one or you could do two or whatever. And you don't have to obviously do the ones that I do, of, although of course you absolutely can. You could maybe choose your own and maybe while I'm stitching I'll talk more about um, other ones that you might choose. Oops. So um, I've got a little quilt in the making here, a mini quilt. Um, I've cut these four little squares. I'm going to just do a four patch out of an old shirt of my husband's. This was the same shirt. I think you've seen it before. It was checked. So I've cut out four from the, the checked areas. So I'm going to piece a little four patch and I've got a little tiny scrap of um, wool wadding and um, actually no it's cotton wadding, cotton wadding. And then I've got this little piece which has also got the blue in it out of my bigger, slightly bigger scraps to make a back. So that needs to come down to kind of at least two and a half inches square or less by the time it's finished so that it fits in my journal. Um, so I've cut these squares at um, one and three quarter inches so that by the time I take a quarter inch seam and a quarter inch seam they'll end up being one and a quarter inches and so then two together will be two and a half inches. Make sense? Good, hope so. So that's going to be my little quilt. For my Japanese borrow piece, um, and I'll talk again, I'll talk more about it while I'm working on it, but I've got, this is another pocket out of my old denim dress, it was the inner pocket so it's an unworn, you know, it's not very worn out, but I liked it because it was dark. And I'm very lucky that I was given some scraps of actual Japanese kimono cotton, indigo dyed, um, by a dear friend of mine, and this piece is double-sided, so I thought I'll put a piece of the lighter colour down there like that, and then make a patch from the other side and stitch that on in the borrow style. And then my third piece, I've got these little scraps of silk. Um, this is vintage sari silk. I got a huge great length of that for a few pounds some years ago on eBay. And I like this little motif. Um, that's a little scrap of blue silk. I can't remember where it came from. Um, that's a scrap of silk from a um, it was actually a mini skirt that I bought from a charity shop, a little tiny, you know, wrap round mini skirt, but it was lovely, lovely silk. And that's, that's from the same sari because it had this lovely purple border. So it gave me two colours for the price of one kind of, so to speak. So that'll be my canther. And then for my darning, I've got a tiny little scrap of wool. You could also use wadding or something, but I just wanted something a bit, you know, sturdy-ish as a foundation. And then this is a bit of very fine wool from a, an old skirt of mine. And so I thought I'd cut a piece out of that, put that on there. There isn't a hole in it, but I'll just do a darn as if there, as if there is. So that's my four. So um, I will start with the patchwork, I think. Um, excuse all the bits on my cloth, but there we go. You know how it is. So the first thing I'm going to do is make my little four patch. Um, I'm going to get my piecing thread. Now, if you do this, you know, if you're a, a quilter and you know about quarter inch seams, if you're unsure and you want to be accurate, you could draw a quarter of an inch line. Because this is a sample and um, I don't really mind if it's wonky, I'm just going to guess. So not in my thread, you know, usual thing. And I'm just going to do, and I'm not going to, you know, this is, this is about, showing and respecting the tradition of patchwork and quilting. It's not about making a perfect mini little quilt. So I'm going to do it, not quickly because this is slow stitching, but I'm going to do it without stressing. So there's two sewn together in the space of time it took me to say one sentence. And I'm just going to do one back stitch to secure that one. And I'm going to do exactly the same with the other pair the other little pair of patches. Um, if that's, yeah, I think that does have a right and wrong side. It doesn't really matter. It's me telling you not to stress and then I start fussing about right and wrong sides. Just sew them together, Catherine. And roughly again a quarter of an inch. A little running stitch along. Um, I've got another two-part video coming up this in the week, which I have filmed already. 
I just need to edit. If I remember at the end, hopefully I'll remember. If not, shout at me. Um, I'll show you the finished article. It's another kind of bag. Anyway, that's for later. So those are my two bits sewn together. Um, so now, once I knock my thread in my rudimentary manner, I'm going to, um, in traditional patchwork and quilting, you press your seams to the side as a rule. And with a four patch, it's a good idea. I'm not going to go and iron these tiny pieces. Someone on my studio tour said, I didn't see your iron. And that's because it's in my son's room since he's away at uni, uh, which is off my studio. And it's freezing. There's no heating on in there. So anyway, I only iron if I have to, because I nearly have to put a hat, coat and gloves on to go in there. So I'm pr I've got that seam going towards the dark piece. And I'm going to do this seam also towards the, the darker piece so that when I put them checkerboard styly, the seams are now going in opposite directions. So then when I lay them right sides together, the two seams sort of nest. Do you see that little nest of seams? Can you see? Focus, hocus pocus. Do you see how they sort of nest together? So now I'm going to get my needle back again. And I'm just going to sew along that in a quarter of an inch in. If you've watched the rice bag video, and I know many of you have, you'll have seen me there making four patches. Um, kind of more accurately with drawn lines and precision pinning and all that stuff. This is very much on the fly. So when you come to where the seam allowances are, you don't want to stitch into them, so you just push that onto one side. You know, we might as well do it somewhat properly. to the middle <clears throat> and then you want to work your way through there with your needle through the base of the seam allowance to the other side and then you want to push the other seam allowance out of the way and then you can finish sewing your other side up and when I get to the end of this line I've made a whole quilt isn't that amazing I made a whole quilt in I don't know a matter of minutes <laughs> It should be fine if you're a little mouse. Um, talking of which, it's gone very cold here and we're in the deepest, darkest countryside. And of course there are mice around the place. If those of you who live rurally will probably um, know about mice. Well, I've got a cat, as you know, you know, the gorgeous Fred Fred, the lord of all he surveys. Is he a good mouser? No, he is not. He's absolutely not. And yesterday evening, I was sitting in the sitting room and um, minding my own business, you know, doing a bit of stitching. I'm just going to press these seams now in a... You'll have to wait for the rest of the story. I just want to show you this. I'm going to press these seams now in a windmill fashion. So that all going in the same direction, just with my fingers. Again, irons could be used if one could be bothered. But they all go in the same direction, and then when you push it down in the middle, you get this weeny weeny little four patch of seam allowances. I get my big fat finger in there. Do you see? You know. Do you see? Right, so now we're going to make the quilt sandwich, and then I'll tell you the rest of the Fred Fred and the mouse story. A bit of wadding which I probably will trim back afterwards so it'll fit in the book. Some wadding, if you're a quilter, you may or may not know this, some waddings have a right and wrong side. If you look at them and you'll see that sometimes they've got what they call a scrim in them to stabilise them. This side you can see little weird little bubbles, that's the scrim side, that you put towards your backing fabric. You want the soft fluffy side up, just a little, you know, by the by. Anyway, so I'm going to put that on there like that. Then I'm going to get my backing fabric face down. And I'm going to put that on there like that, and I'm going to make sure it's somewhat straight. And then if it was a great big quilt, you might either baste it, um, or um, you might use safety pins. I'm just going to use my little applique pins. <laughs> so self-conscious when I say that now, and I cover the self-consciousness by exaggerating how I say it. Um, just like that. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> 
and then I'm going to quilt it. And all I'm going to do, I think, is do the, um, you could stitch in the ditch, go through the seam. I'm going to do, I think, a, um, what do you call that when you're a quarter of an inch away from the seam? I can't remember. Quilters will tell me. I'm going to stitch roughly a quarter of an inch away from the seam. And I'm going to quilt it with, what am I going to, I'm going to quilt it with this blue, which is a bit of wool thread that was dyed with indigo. But, you know, you can use whatever. So I'm going to start in the middle. And I'm going to do some fairly biggish. This is not proper quilting, you know, proper quilting with a, a fine needle, as fine as a fairy's hair. Um, and um, how many stitches can you get per inch and all that? that that's not this. That's not this. I'm not doing that. So I'm going to stop sort of half an inch from the edge because I've got the seam allowance plus I want, you know, the half an inch, the quarter inch from the seam thing. Just a somewhat square square. Um, yes, Fred, Fred and the mouse. So I'm sitting there in the sitting room, stitching away, minding my own business. And Fred, Fred's sitting in the doorway. And as it turned out, it's because, horror of horrors, there were no biscuits in his little bowl. Um, so he's sitting there looking very disgruntled. And the mouse ran virtually over his paws. Across the room, virtually over his paws. And he sat there and he kind of did a little start, a little jumpy movement with his head. And looked where the mouse had gone. And then if cats could shrug nonchalantly, like, Pfft, not my problem, that's what he did. <laughs> so no, he's not a mouser. And I've no idea where that mouse ended up, probably in the wall somewhere. The problem with this house, well it's not a problem, but the thing with this house is it's built of stone and there's no kind of cement or anything like that between the stones. It's basically earth between the stones. So of course it's very easy for little creatures to dig through. It's just the way it is. So I'm back to the middle. It's lovely with when quilting, when you put some stitches through the layers. Because I called it wadding. Obviously Americans know I mean batting. Um, you get this lovely feeling to it straight away. So I'm going to jump over here. And I'm going to just go around this other blue square. So Fred Fred's rubbish, but he's not as rubbish as my old cat Barney, who I lost um, in 2019, just before the pandemic. It was a pretty, you know, the, the cat I had before I had Fred Fred. Barney used to catch mice outside, and I, I have witnessed this with my own very eyes. Bring them inside alive, and release them, <laughs> and just let them live in the house. So I don't know what it is about me and cats that aren't good mousers. Perhaps I feed them too well. And, you know, I have nothing against mice. They're dear little things when you see them up close. But if you get too many of them in your house, they, they, they don't mind where they, where, they, where they do their business, shall we say. <laughs> and it can be a bit unpleasant. So I have to make sure that everything edible by us humans and and animals is um, in, in closed cupboards. Last year when we still had the chickens, we got a really bad mouse problem come the winter. I mean, the little monkeys were running around the room nonchalantly when we were sitting there. That's how brave they were. And uh, one day I even saw one eating Fred's cat biscuits out of his bowl. So, you know, like you say over the pond, go figure. <laughs> I think that's the correct use of that term. Um, just one thing to note, I'm because it's a sample, I've done this on the back, you know. It's very naughty. If you're a proper quilter, you wouldn't obviously do that because the back of your quilt would be on view and show. What you do, and I should have done it really, is just work your needle through the wadding slash batting to the next place. But I've just been naughty and just jumped across. So I have nearly gone around this square with my mouse tails. 
Another creature we have here is, in French, they call it a Loire, L-O-I-R. I can't remember if there's an E on the end, a Loire. And I, they talk about them here, they're fairly common. We've got them in the, in the woodlands. And they look like a little mousy, gerbily type thing. But they've got a shorter tail and the tail's fluffy. Um, and I, I looked them up to see what they were called in English because I'd never heard of them when we first lived here. And their name, poor little things, is Edible Dormouse. I just feel so sorry for a creature whose name has, has the word edible in it. <laughs> But anyway, we have those as well. And we hadn't been here very long. And um, the house was hadn't been lived in for a long time. I'm going to do the proper thing here just to show you. So I've come through to the back. And I'm going to go back in the same hole I came out. And I'm going to get my needle through. See, it's only in the wadding. And then I'm going to come up where I want to be. That's the proper way to do it. If you're only going a short distance. If you're going a long distance, then obviously you should finish off and... Start again. So yes, we hadn't lived when we bought the house. It was it wasn't you know it was what the French call habitable, habitable. You could you can live in it, but it was very basic. The room that's now the kitchen dining room had one old, not very nice sort of nineteen seventies orange and brown sink in it, and there was a, a wood burning fire. A closed in fire with the glass. Well, it should have been closed in, but some of the glass panes were broken, so it was really difficult to keep it, keep it going. You know, keep it not roaring and not. You know what I mean. Um, and anyway, and there was a, a shower room. Well, there, there still is a shower room, with a shower and a loo. A loo is English for for you know facilities. I don't know what slang is in other countries. I think Australians call it a dunny, but I don't know if that's a bit coarse to call it that. So apologies if you're Australian and you're offended by my use of that word. But I'm a mere English woman and I didn't know. Um, so anyway, in the in the loo, the, the lavatory, um, I, I went in to go to the, the loo one day. So I'm talking about going to the loo. Anyway, um, and I lifted the lid. And before I sat, luckily, I sort of looked. And in there was this little edible dormouse slash loire with his two little paws and his little nose poking out of the water looking at me oh dear so I went and got a big glove on and um, he, he let me pick him up very very gently he, you know he was quite happy to be rescued I think and um, let him go in the woods I'm just going to finish this off on the back so now my husband's put something over the you know the pipe the way he came in so I can't get in there anymore so, yeah, I hope that story didn't freak you out, those of you of a nervous disposition. Um, but I have now finished my quilt. Country life, eh? And I do want to make sure... Um, I don't know, am I going to trim it now? I'm going to, I think I'm going to leave it like that until I've made my other three pieces. So that's my little quilt, for what it's worth. Next up, because it's next on my pile, I'm going to do my canther. Now I've got four layers of silk. If you don't have silk, you could use cottons, fine cottons, you know, but you want something thin because the principle of canther, and I'm talking about the sort of utilitarian everyday canther, is to use up worn out saris and, you know, other textiles. I need to get it sort of somewhere within the region of two and a half so it will fit. Um, I don't mind too much if things overhang the edges. I'm going to cut a little bit off there. I want to get this motif. Um, yeah, they, so they, they would layer together other things that were precious scrap that would um, that were worn out, and make a little sandwich of several layers of wood. I, I think they they do still they still do, and um, they would stitch that sandwich together with long lines of running stitches. Um, so I've got my little scrap, I'm just measuring, I'm just going here because I've got my cutting mat underneath. That's more or less okay. Um, so there I've got one layer. So if you're going to make this with your little layers, you could, if you had slightly thicker cloth, just do two or three layers. Do the audition thing with the needle, you know, that I've talked about before. So put your few layers together and then um, go through it with a ne an empty needle in and out as if you were stitching to make sure it's pleasant to stitch through. 
so important that things are pleasant to stitch through. We don't want to be fighting. I don't, oh yeah, there we go, it's gone. It's the thing with silk, when you rip it, you know, you get all these thready threads. I have been known to rip threads out of silk and then use them to stitch into the silk. We might do that one day. Not necessarily with silk, but, you know, with some kind of cloth. So there's one, there's two from a sandwich. I'm not going to worry about all these loose threads. I'll worry about them later, if at all. Um, you can put them in any order you like, obviously. Decide what you want on the outside, because the inside ones will, apart from apart from on the very edges, no, that doesn't want to tear, I'm going to cut it. I'm going to cut it, dear Henry, dear Henry. You know the song? There's a hole in my bucket. There's no line in it saying you want, I'm going to cut it, it just reminded me. Right, and I might leave them different sizes so they do poke out a bit. Um, I think that's maybe kind of fun to do that. This piece has got, this was from the edge of my sari, so it's got a selvage. Tears nicely and makes a nice sound if you like it. Oh, sorry, I didn't warn you. I have to warn you when I'm tearing because some people don't like the sound of tearing. Which, along the theme of diversity, you know, some of us love the sound of tearing. There was a little mini discussion going on in the Facebook group um, about people finding it therapeutic to tear cloth, and other people don't like it. To them, it's like fingernails on a blackboard. Diversity. Getting back to the theme, see what I did there. Okay, so I've got my little canther sandwich. Um, I'm going to, because it's slippy, slippy silk, just put some little pins in. One, two. And then if you um, have ever seen videos or if you've been lucky enough to go to India and actually see women working, they tend to stitch away from themselves in that direction. And they have a, quite a big needle and they load the needle with stitches, pull through, and they don't pull the thread all the way through. And then they load a bit more, pull through, load a bit more, pull through, and then pull the thread all the way through, if that makes sense. And this teeny tiny piece, I can't really do that. And also I'm much more comfortable stitching right to left. So I'm going to do it like that. And I'm just going to do biggish running stitches. And I've got um, two, and I'm doing the knot on the front, because that's a lady suggested that a while ago about putting knots on fronts. I'd never thought of it, and now I'm going to do it. Um, and I'm going to just do some running stitches. I'm going to let the fabric pucker ever so slightly, not, not too, too much. Um, yeah, I've got, sorry, I've got two strands of silk that I dyed with Buddleia flowers. Um, I just, you know, I like to stitch silk with silk. But obviously you can use whatever you have to hand. And I was trying to do two or three stitches together in the spirit of how it actually is done, but I'm in such a habit of only taking one stitch at a time. Sorry, I'm coming right up in your face. Now I'm going to do a parallel line and I'm going to offset my stitches. And you can play with all kinds of variations. If you've seen my running stitch video, you'll I'll talk more about it. I think I'm going to um, do this next stitch so that it falls halfway between the previous stitch, you see what I mean? And then comes up halfway the space. But you can experiment. Um, you get different effects depending on how what are you, that's a bit of Japanese borrow thread getting in there. Um, you can experiment with the different effects that you get depending on where you place your stitches or your lines of stitches in relation to each other. I'm noticing there that when I go through that embroidery it's slightly more resistant. Ouch! And I'm noticing there that I poked myself in the thumb and it hurt. <laughs> And I went, ouch, when well, you heard me. I'm getting all silky threads caught, but you know. And coming up there. 
And I've, I have got a, a camphor in the other room. I don't think it's a new one. Uh, sorry, I don't think it's a, a, an old one. But I got it from a shop called Dillyway and Dillyway in, in Gloucestershire in Somerset, which I referred to in my studio tour. So there's a, um, I can't remember what they're called. There's a name for them. You know, the embroidered pieces that go over doorways and things. Um, so anyway, I've, I've got a piece of camphor from there. And each, it's quite a long piece, I guess it's, well, it's longer than I am. I think it's maybe six feet or so. What's that? A couple of metres um, or so. And each line of stitching is one thread, as far as I can tell. I must admit that I haven't been entirely over it stitch by stitch, but certainly at each end is the end of a thread. Let me get that pin out the way. And I do know that they do use very long lengths of thread, and that's why they do that, taking a few stitches, pulling it through, but not all the way through. And then they pull it all the way through when they get to the end. Turning round, quite like the gold on the pink. I wasn't sure when I chose it, but now I see it. I'm happy with it. And it picks up the gold of that piece. Let's just try and simulate. My needle's not as long as it could be for... Um, so I've taken three or four stitch, three stitches and I'll pull it through that far. And you see I've still got my loop there. Cross your fingers for me. And I'm going to take a couple more stitches, get the pin out and pull that through but still not all the way. I don't know, my end's in there somewhere, that's maybe not so handy. And then I'm going to do my last, see it's shifting, shifty, shifty, shifty silk. My last stitch to get me to the end. So imagine I just stitch two meters of, of silks together and then pull, do you see? And then at that point you can play with the tension a little bit as well. Do you see as I pull it, do you see how these little ripples form? And that is one of the very distinctive features of Canther, that you get these lovely little ripples in the cloth. So I go through to the back and hop over for my next line. Do you see how it's gone all um, on a slant? That's because it's not been properly pinned into place, but I'm not worried. I'm going to come back the other way. So while I finish this little piece, um, maybe if you wanted to choose your own textile traditions to to make for, for this week's prompt of diversity, um, you could, if you had, were a cross-stitcher, or if one of the women in your family, or men, let's be inclusive, there are men who stitch too, um, had, had done cross-stitching or embroidery or um, beadwork, lace making, even crocheting or knitting, you know, if you wanted to knit a little piece or crochet a little piece to put in your journal, because that's a, a textile tradition that is personal to you. Um, what else is there? What else? I mean, there's many, many types of embroidery, isn't there? There's sort of um, counted thread work and um, um, needlepoint and petit point is very fine embroidery, any of those things. So, ju so just, you know, have a think and um, have a think about what what you enjoy or what people in your family have done that you remember or what you like to do yourself or what was the, what was the first textile craft that, that you did, you know, and, and think about maybe why you chose that, why that appealed to you. And is are you still doing that now, or is that, or was that particular um, craft that you chose a jumping-off point for another craft? You know, it's, it's just thinking about the journey of how you've got to where you are with your own, with your own um, textile work, and that is again a very important part of slow stitch. Thinking about the story. So I think I'm going to do one more line after this one and then call my little canther quilt 
done. As you see, even though I said four, I said I'm going to make four pieces, um, it's, it's doable. And obviously you can take as much time or as little time as you want with yours. No, I think I'm going to leave it like that. And you know why? Because there are seven lines of stitching and I like odd numbers. So I'm just going to leave it like that. I'm just going to go to the back, take a back stitch, put my thread through the loop, and um, take another stitch just to anchor the loop. And call that a jobs a good one, as they say in the West Country and maybe elsewhere. Jobs a good one. And there he is. And you see the ripples? Yeah, I think they show up nicely on the silk. So there's my canther. Done and dusted. Put my little silk scraps away because they go in the in the scraps in a minute, in a bit. Maybe have a little tidy up in between as we leave India and hop across the world to Japan and um, that's clean enough Catherine they don't want to watch you cleaning your cloth for hours so in comes my little piece of and this will obviously be synthetic indigo that this has been dyed with because it's off a you know a dress that I bought. Um, now a quick way because I've now torn that so that it's just shy of two and a half inches that way. A quick way if you want a square is to then fold on the diagonal. Can you see that? So that those edges line up, and then you do your little snip before you tear. Just at the. I hope you can see. If not, you can do the zooming in. You can zoom like that with your fingers if you've got a touch screen. Do your little snip there, and then tear, and then what you're left with is a square. Do you see? If I fold it that way, it's a square, and obviously if I fold it that way, it's a square. That's if I'm making, if I'm doing a lot of patchwork squares, I'll often tear them like that, rather than you know I'll, I'll tear a strip the right width, and then tear my squares off the strip so that I'm not cutting out patiently by sciz with scissors or rotary cutting out of each one. Just a little quick tip. So that's going to be my background cloth. And I want to put it on this denim, which may or may not tear. I think I'm going to make the denim slightly bigger. If they overlap in my book or hang off the edge of the page, I'm not bothered. Oh, that will tear. Thought it wasn't going to for a minute. Um, so I'm going to do it like that. Now will it tear this way? Sometimes it tears one way and not the other because sometimes it tears on the warp and not on the weft but it behaved itself. Right. Sorry, I was quite violent with it then. Sorry about that. So I'm going to put that there, that way up and then on the top of there I'm going to put a tiny, teeny little square. I'm going to use this end. Can you see the end? Because it's got still in it. That's not my, That's not me stitching and that's barely hanging on by a thread those two little bits but I would quite like to try and keep them so I think I'm going to go somewhere there and um, think of the hands that may have well someone did, someone stitched into that but I don't know who and I don't know when and now Vera Lynn springs to mind if you remember Vera Lynn I don't think any of us remember her actually because she was quite a long time ago but um, I would imagine English English people will know, or British people will know who I'm talking about. Um, and then you're not hardly going to see them because I want to use the dark side. I should actually have used this for that, but anyway, I know they're there. Do I want it in the middle? No, I think I'm going to put it like that, on a jaunty angle. And um, what am I going to stitch? I was going to stitch it on with this same indigo dyed <coughs> blue that I used to <coughs> sorry quilt my um, quilt my little patchwork quilt so I'm putting a knot um, I'm having my knot on the front just because I'm going to start somewhere off the patch you see I'm not bothered to pin it because it's, it's quite well behaved it's not slipping about and I'm just going to go across the patch one way with quite big stitches and off the edge of the patch that way and 
straight away you'll see, and you may well know already, that what I'm doing here is exactly the same as the canthus stitch. So we, we've gone from India to Japan, <coughs> and we're doing something that looks very different, the finished result, but we're stitching the same way. And the, the way um, stitching is done in Japan, so the sashko stitching, and they have a little leather thimble disc that fits on their hand. They hold the needle slightly differently to how, certainly how I hold the needle. But the end result, you're doing parallel lines of running stitch, basically. It's, you know, connected by a common thread. And maybe that will be the, sub, the, the subtext <laughs> from the word diversity. To bring in that idea of not only difference, but respecting and honouring each other's differences. Does that make sense? And this piece of thread is not going to be long enough, but no biggie, I'll get another bit. I hope you can see. Stella's snoring, I don't know if you can hear her. Um, I just checked the, the footage that I, uh, at the beginning of me talking to you. Um, because a lot of you seem to like that in my studio tour, which was the last the video before this that I uploaded, me talking to you. So um, I thought I, I'd give it a whirl, see if I I liked doing that, and see if you liked it. But anyway, so I filmed that little bit at the beginning where I showed you the you know you remember it wasn't that long ago, and then when I, I looked back at it before moving on to make sure that it all looked okay. And then I saw that Stella was asleep on the chair in the background, I had no idea. I'm just going to do a couple of stitches on the back. <clears throat> I had no idea she was there. She sneaked in, she was very quiet, but now she's snoring. Uh, need a bit more of this lovely pale blue wool. There we go. I'd always rather cut off more than I think I need, and then if there's any left over, I'll put it in my orts, in my Vimto tin, than, you know, try and guesstimate and end up with a, another short bit and have to get a third lot. But I don't waste things. I don't. I wouldn't throw that away. That precious bit of thread. Well, I wouldn't throw any thread away if it was still useful. But um, certainly not this precious indigo dyed wool. So I've got one more line to do. Going this way. Turn it round. And again, on the back, I'm just jumping across, and I have seen actual borrow pieces um, and that is what happens. It's very much utilitarian as a, as a concept. We, we see them now as beautiful pieces of art. Well, you know, those of us who appreciate that kind of thing, but it is very much a utilitarian thing that was brought about by, by poverty and need actually and I think it's important to bear that in mind and respect that if you're doing something and that is what and I've said it before in my little journal when I made my football the journal was small the videos were not small I think there was four of them in the end um, the borrow inspired journal that I'm always careful to insert the word inspired I don't never say I'm making borrow it's um it's just, you know, I think it goes further than pedantry, it's, it's about respect. So now I'm going to stitch across the other direction, perpendicular to my first, um, my first stitches. Up and down, up and down. And then that patch there, the, you know, the top patch, really becomes almost one with the, the cloth underneath. 
Oops. <clears throat> and again, I'm getting, and I've talked about it before, when you do this running stitch one way and the other, sometimes you get these little crosses that happen. When you, when you cross a, a previous stitch, she's really snoring now. That's, that's not me snoring. Well, I can't. Well, no, I can talk in my sleep. My husband often says that I don't even shut up when I'm asleep. <laughs> um, apparently what I say in my sleep is unintelligible. But he snores, so, you know. He's in a position to be slinging mud around, as they say. But the way I'm, I'm feeling this cloth changing in my fingers as I'm stitching, the, the thread is just giving an extra layer and more structure to the piece. The word sashko, actually, in Japanese, well, sashko merely refers to the stitching. It's often used by us Westerners to describe the sort of the patterns. You know when you draw, often with chalk on a cloth, the traditional Japanese sashko patterns, and then stitch often with white thread onto the dark blue cloth. People call that sashko, but sashko um, unless I'm mistaken, and I don't think I am, refers merely to the stitching. And I think the word sashko itself means little stabs. And it is pronounced like that, sashko, you know, as close as I can get being English and not Japanese, rather than sashiko. Sash, I think that the E is virtually not there, so it's sashko, sashko. Something like that. I've, there's a feature in Google, if you put um, words like that in, you can ask for it to be told, said to you in the language, you know, of the word. Does that make sense? I do it often with French words if I'm not sure of the pronunciation. And then some nice person in my, in my um, tablet or my telephone tells me how, um, how to pronounce it. <laughs> And I do my best. I do my best with my weird English mouth that's only used to speak in English. That's the biggest problem. Right, so there's my little um, borrow-inspired patch. And I'll show you it next to the canther. Do you see I've done exactly the same stitch, but they look quite different. And even the stitching looks quite different. It's not only because they're different colours and different cloths. So I've got my little stack of three now. So my fourth and final one is going to be my darn. Madarn, Madarn it. Um, this, oh, this skirt, I'll tell you the story of this skirt while I'm doing Madarn. I'm um, quite like that end, so I think I'm going to leave that angly bit and cut myself that bit. <clears throat> Put it on there. Yes, very jaunty, looks like it's blowing in the breeze, which is quite fitting for this little bit of skirt. So now I'm going to do a darn. I think I'm going to use this black. Um, I hope I don't live to rue the day because this is um, coton à reprise. There's my wonderful French accent. Apologies to any French people watching, um, which is mending cotton. So I'm going to do a very rudimentary darn. I'm going to imagine that there's a hole somewhere or a worn patch in the middle of here. Um, I'm not going to do it properly like my grandmother showed me. S apologies, grandmother. Uh, I am going to just stitch round as if there was a hole. And if there was a hole, I might be something like... Well, you want to basically make sure that you're in sound cloth if you're... I'm going to do more videos in the future about mending, I think, at one point. And particularly visible mending, which is a whole thing. But um, basically, I need to, you need to make sure if there's an actual hole or a worn patch that you're stabilising stitches or in good cloth, you know, cloth that's not worn. Because that's the scaffolding that your darn sits on. And I didn't mean to make it this big, but, you know. Uh, that's what happened. So I'm pretending there's a hole there, and I'm just stitching a little... vaguely circular 
shape around the outside of the hole. If there was an actual hole, I might be something like an eighth of an inch away from the edge of it, or a bit further, depending on, like I said, how um, stable the cloth was. So now I've done that. It's quite nice just like that, but it's not a darn. So now I'm going to do uh, some big stitches. I come up there, over this way. So it's like you're making a warp to weave through. And um, I'm going to do them quite far apart, so it will be a very open darn. Because if I did a very fine darn, um, it would take me many, many hours, possibly, or, you know, an hour or more. My husband's got a lovely sh linen shirt that I bought him from a charity shop in England that was perfect in every way and unworn and unstained. Well, it had been worn, but, you know, it wasn't worn out. Um, and the only thing was it had in it, in one of the cuffs, a tiny little hole. Someone had caught it on a nail or something, probably, I don't know. And I darned it with very fine linen thread because the shirt was linen. And he still wears it to this day. I think it's I think I bought it maybe ten or twelve years ago. And um, I don't know if he still does, but he used to proudly show people the darn in his shirt. Um so there I've got five stitches going across. If I was doing it properly I'd have those strands probably sitting right up against each other. But I'm not doing it properly. So now I'm gonna come up here and go the other way. Because this is just, now here you have to be careful, especially since I've got stranded thread. And I know some people would change their needle to a blunter needle. But I'm just going to be careful. And you see I'm just weaving. So I've gone over, under, over, under. And then that one's going to be over and dive back down into there. That way. And then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to come up again. And again, for much further apart than I would if I was doing it properly and come up again, and then I'm going to go back the other way, but where I've gone over, I'm going to go under, you know, you know, just normal weave. Under, over, under, over, under. Whoops. And that's the problem with the sharp needle, you catch things you don't mean to catch. If you're darning socks or something, you know, some a knitted fabric, you'd use a blunt, a very blunt needle. Because you, you can pierce through, you know, like the needles, if you're a knitter, you have those sewing needles that you use for sewing your ends in, that kind of thing. I will show you at one point my, my darning mushroom. I might even darn a sock one day on here with my little furry friend sleeping innocently on the chair behind me in the house. I have to darn quite a lot of socks because she's very fond of, um, if she manages to get hold of one, I'm making little holes in them. So I've gone back again. Do you see it's really open? But I really want to show that it's a darn. It's more to show the structure of it and the idea of it. And for me, the memory of seeing my granny of an evening sitting in her wing back chair by the fire, um, darning socks with a, a darning. Again, my, uh, she had a darning mushroom. My darning mushroom is not my granny's, sadly. Um, I don't know what happened to that one. Um, but I found this one in a, at a textile fair in the UK. And it's very similar. So I kind of bought it as a replacement. So I've got going to do one more row going back the other way. And then I've got five strands there and then five strands there. That's just me. I like a bit of symmetry sometimes. Um, this one, last time I went under, so I'm going to go over it and then under that one, over that, under that, and pull it through, and then shoot back down into there, and there's my little darn. And there we go. So that's my four little pieces. Let's finish it off on the back. If it was knitting, you know, if it was a sock or a jumper or something, You'd weave your end in, and I'm just going to do it like that. So I've got my little darn. Can you see them? Yeah, my little darn. I've got my little borrow-inspired patch. I've got my little canther-inspired patch, and I got my little patchwork quilt. And I need to sort of decide. I just get the book in. 
If you um, want to know more about this book and you haven't yet seen the tutorial, there's a two-part video about how I make, made this. I know many of you, and I've seen in the private Facebook book group, have made your own journals, and many of you have come up with other ideas about how to use and display your pieces. Um, but anybody coming in later to the, you know, later in the day or whatever, this is normal sketchbook paper, tea dyed. The pages are five by seven, five by seven, um, and the cover is um, was slow stitched by me over a long period of time. And this is some woolly blanket. But if you want to know how I made it, there's a two part tutorial in the playlist for this project, the Slow Stitch Weekly 2024. Okay, so I'm going to put them on this page. So I'm going to I'm going to trim it back with my scissors to the edges of my little patches. But you know, if you make a little quilt like this and you want to do it different, if you want to bind the edge, you know, properly, um, if you wanted to leave the backing fabric bigger and double turn it to the front and whip stitch it down so it made a little binding, you could do that. I'm sure you'll come up with many, many ideas um, of your own. You do you, like I always say. And so there, that really feels now like a, a little quilty sandwich. No, I'll go for that, because the yellow and the yellow, I like them on opposite diagonals. So I'm going for that, so remember that in your brain. And I'm going to stitch them to the page. Um, so I'm going to take those two off for a minute. Turn it round. And I'm going to take that one off, and I'm going to stitch this one down here somewhere. Make sure I've only got one page. I did once stitch through two pages. Get the giant paper clips because they're always, always wanting to come out to play. Whoops, put my needle down. I've got too many things in my hand. Get my needle back. And I'm going to anchor, sorry about my arm, and I've got this, my big fluffy Icelandic jumper on, one of my big fluffy Icelandic wool jumpers, because it was really cold in here this morning. So what I've done is, i get my arm out of the way, I've just come up through the back of the cloth piece, because that's much sturdier to hold the, the tension of the knot. So I've come through, and now I'm going to go down through the paper. Oops, it caught on something. Oh, look, naughty. Naughty, naughty, naughty. Uh, we don't want the, as much as we love you, giant paper clip, we don't want you permanently attached to the book. A bit more slack. There we go. Crisis averted. I think I can take you off now anyway. I think it's held enough. There we go. That's all right. So I'm going to go down and up once more. I hope you can see what I'm doing. Again, don't forget that zoomy thing. That some lovely. I wish I could remember the lady's name who told me in the comments, but I'm passing it on. Um, that you can do the zooming. Um, here we go. And I will also put photos of mine as well. So, you know, still photos in the private Facebook group. Which I didn't do last week or the week before. Maybe I should have done. So I'm going to use the same blue to um, stitch this little borrow inspired piece down. And I should say as well, the, the Facebook group, it's not only for um, the weekly stitch along, it's also for anything you make from following any of my tutorials. Um, but I do want to keep it only for my subscribers. So there's a little question to answer if you apply to join. Um, but then you'll be very welcome. And if you want to post and comment and be active there, that of course that's wonderful. But if you just want to join so that you can look at other people's work, that's also wonderful. So again, I'm going to finish off in the cloth, not the paper, because the cloth is sturdier. I'm just going to do that. And because I'm over here at this side again, like I did earlier on, um, I think it was last week's piece. Come on. There you go. And I've got this lovely length of blue. I'm going to leave that there because then I might put some little beads or dangles of some kind on there in a minute. So now, 
get the uh, paper clip off. <coughs> Pardon me. I had the little yellow piece there, didn't I? Like it there because it's pointing that way. It doesn't matter that it hangs off the edge, as long as I get a few stitches along there, I'll be happy. So I'm going to come through the back of the woolly bit. Now, probably I can get away with doing it like this. Which I always much prefer. Only then that's going to happen. Of course it is. I'm going to have to angle it slightly. And a couple more. Oops. I didn't tell you about this skirt, and I did say I would. Just so I'll tell you quickly. Um, I bought this skirt many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, in a charity shop in England. And actually what I bought was a, a bag of rags. I used to go in and they had clothes that had been donated that weren't fit to, to sell as clothes. And they would be sent off to be recycled. But I went in and, you know, made friends with the, the volunteers. And... Um, then they would let me have a route through before it got sent off to be recycled and, and pick some things and give them, you know, I just give a donation to the, whatever charity it was. And this was a skirt that was in the rag bag, in effect, but I liked it and I wore it as a skirt. Do I want another dangle? I might, so I'm going to leave a bit in case. Um, so anyway, but I liked it as a skirt, even though it was very worn, and but it was lovely and soft. And I, I just, I just like wearing old clothes, you know, I'm not, i never really, even as a child, been a fan of brand new clothes. Um, so I, anyway, I wore this lovely wool skirt and it had godets, you know, panels. So it was very narrow around the waist. And I was also narrow around the waist in those days. Um, and then it flared out and it was long, nearly to my ankles. And um, I love wearing it. And I would swan around the fields with the dogs in this skirt and my boots, thinking I was, you know, I don't know, a lady from... Time's gone by. Um, and one day I was, and it, and it wore out here and there, and I patched it and I mended it. And one day I was um, climbing over a stile, which I think they exist outside of the UK, but where there's a fence, there's two little stakes, and then there's a little plank going through. So you step up on the plank, climb over the fence, onto the plank, and down again. In, in case, you know, I'm sure all of you know what a stile is, but anyway. Um, so I was climbing over this style and I caught it on a nail and I ripped it right along um, the seam of one godet. So it was ripped from waist to hem. <laughs> um, so I went home holding it together with my hands in order to preserve my modesty and decided at that point it was so fragile that it would have to be, you know, cut up and reused in, in my pieces. So that's the story of that skirt. Now... And, um, yeah, just checking I hadn't picked up a second page. I'm going to come mm, through the back of the silk. I'm only in the silk. I felt my knot pop through, so I'm going to do a tiny back stitch as well. That's better. And, and you see what I'm doing. <clears throat> I'm going to stab stitch this because I think you can see better that way. <clears throat> there we go, a couple more stitches. Now, if you are utterly overwhelmed by the idea of doing four pieces, like I said, you could do less. But if you are overwhelmed by the idea of doing four pieces and you don't think you have time, and but you do want to do more than one piece, you could, I mean, obviously next Monday there will be another piece, but you could do one now and then you could come back later and add some more. You know, if you had more time in the future, you can come back and add to it. You could even have put some here as well. If you wanted to stitch on here and you've already stitched here, you could stitch through there, you know, like put it somewhere where it doesn't interfere if you've written like I had. Um, you can always come back and add is my point. Don't feel like you have to do each week that week and then the opportunity's gone forever. Oh, no, I'm not in the thing anymore. And the trouble with paper is once you've made a hole, it doesn't go away. But anyway. 
It doesn't matter. Right. I'm just going to finish this off with a little back stitch and a loopy loop. And then come a loop. And um, I'm not going to leave this thread for a dangler because it's only, you know, it's just brown piecing thread. It's not that interesting. So get my giant paper clip off, making sure I don't snag my stitches on the way. And um, I'm going to find some little beads. Excuse me, I did not put my bead tin here ready like I should have done. It won't be one second. I'm just going over here. You now know where I'm going if you've watched my studio tour. I'm over by my sewing machine. Stella's got up to follow me. I'm coming back. I've got my one of my tins of... Um, Broken necklaces. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Again. I'm going to have a little root for something to tie on the ends. Oops. That's, that's quite nice, isn't it? With a little. Okay, I might put that on there, complete with its chain. That's the same as that. Maybe I'll try and get that one on there. That's my page. Now I need to write my words. I'll do that. But you know, you can do, you do you, as always. So, diversity. Oops. I'm going to do bound by. By well, do you tell? Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a common thread here, and then instead of signing here because there's not much room, I'm going to sign just under the corner of that, so that there's something under this one, like that. And I'm going to put the date, which will be the 15th, 01, 01, 24. Halfway through January nearly. It's quite amazing. And there we are. That is my week three. So I've got my bar inspired, my darn, my patchwork quilt inspired piece and my piece of canther inspired piece and then I've got diversity bound by a common thread and then I've signed it to K3N and a little kiss and the date. So I hope you like that and um, please if you're in the Facebook group and you feel like sharing do and um, go and look at what everybody else has been making and if you're not in the Facebook group and you're a subscriber or if you'd like to subscribe Please join us. Um, it's lo a lovely, caring, sharing environment. Link down there. And um, oh, quickly, a little sneaky peek. Coming this week, I'll just put my stitch journal to one side. I did promise, and I've just remembered a two parter because I've videoed it and it's over two hours, so I'll divide it into two part. So, of how to make, it's coming in this bag. And it's somewhat inspired by a Japanese rice bag type. So I'm right up in your face, it's quite a big one. In that it's drawstring. Oh, I've got some scraps of sheet in there. Um, it's a slow stitched outer. And then the base is the cloth twine. So if you want to know how I made this, look out for that. It will be coming, part one certainly will be coming sometime this week. Possibly Wednesday, but I can't promise. But, you know, make sure you're subscribed and then you won't miss it. So that's it for week three of the Slow Stitch Along. And thank you very much for joining me. I hope you have fun with it. And I look forward to you joining me next time for more Cloth Tales. Thank you. Bye-bye.